Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Glenn Schultz. As Clint mentioned, I'm the managing director of the FDT group. Just a little bit about the FDT group before we get started. Uh, we're an international nonprofit organization. We're headquartered in Belgium, as Clint mentioned. And our only purpose is really to develop and advance the FDT standard. So it's a technical standard that's supported by more than 90 organizations around the world, universities, uh, manufacturers like you were introduced to today, uh, large end users also support it. And so besides advancing the technology that's in the standard that you'll learn a lot about today, we also then help just with uh, getting other manufacturers on board with the standard, uh, going around doing events like this so you as end users are aware of what the possibilities are in your facilities when you apply the standard and so on. So um, Katrine's out of our office in Belgium. She's our office manager there. So if you're ever communicating with our office via email, chances are it'll be Katrine on the other end of the email. But of course, I'm always available too. I have business cards here if you'd like to have one after today. And I'll ap apologize a little bit in advance. You'll see Katrine and I leaving partway through the afternoon only because we have to catch a flight back to Europe because then we head to Tokyo next week. So a <laughs> little tight schedule. But let's get a little bit into um, FDT. We'll have some time for questions at the end. So uh, feel free to store those up and we'll try to knock them off towards the end. So first, why FDT? I think you guys, as practicing uh, end users of technology, realize some of the challenges that exist out there today when you do a process or factory automation project. You know, it's no longer uncommon that you're going to have 10 or more, maybe even dozens and dozens of different suppliers of components that are making up your complete automation package. And Similarly, it's not unusual to have hundreds, sometimes even thousands of different device types between all the different pressure, temperature, flow, and so on type meters, all the I.O. stuff, all the drives and everything else. By the time you add it all up, it's a substantial bill of material for a typical project. And the I.O.s themselves, I think, are just constantly on the rise, primarily because it's become much more convenient to extend the I.O. throughout the automation with all the networks that are available to do that. You know, you no longer have to do all this long home wiring to remote I.O. cabinets. You can actually drop blocks of remote I.O. all over the place. So we see remote I.O. on the rise in these projects as well. So I think probably one of the bigger challenges, though, of all those is this topic of multi-vendor reality, that today there's so many unique applications and so many vendors that specialize in niche parts of the market to supply instruments and controls and other things that you really need to pick the best in class in order to have the optimum process automation or factory automation solution. So you as the end user find it desirable to go around and meet with the companies like are sponsoring here today and say, okay, I've got this really special application what kind of instrument do you have? Or what kind of drive do you have that I can use for this unique pumping application? Whatever it might be, you're looking for those vendors that can give you that little extra edge to better manage your uh, automation package. And so this reality of multi-vendors becomes even stronger in automation systems. And then if that's not enough, then you can talk about the complexity of networks. There's hardly an end user I've met over my 25 years in the automation industry that wouldn't say, we have our standard. You know, we prefer to implement HART, or we prefer to implement Foundation Field Bus, or we prefer Profi Bus, whatever it might be. And that's usually pretty well adhered to, but then there's issues like legacy parts of a facility that have other networks in them that you still need to integrate, or somebody's going to deliver some very unique piece of equipment that you absolutely got to use, but they only offer that in one other network that's not your favorite network. So you get this multi-network uh, requirement going on in your automation packages. And it can be well-recognized networks. It might be some that are specifically tailored to high-speed uh, servo motor applications, if you've got that in your, <laughs> one more visitor, if you've got that in your uh, process automation a package, or it could be just generic things, or it could be something that's a simple, low-cost network to give you real inexpensive remote I.O. in your application. Or today, I think the more topical thing is people are looking pretty hard at wireless. You know, whether it's wireless just to get another point or two of measurement into the system, 
or if it's wireless to actually do a full wireless application. So we need to handle this multi-network capability in almost every case that automation packages get deployed. So with that being said, with all these vendors, with all these networks, everybody has their favorite tool that they'll send you with their device that'll configure the device, maintain the device, whatever it is. They've got some unique little thing that comes on a CD, DVD, or USB stick, or you download it, and pretty soon you look like the guy on the right-hand side of the screen where you're just buried in all these tools. You can't possibly manage them. You can't distribute them to your maintenance techs, so they don't have what they need when they need it. This is the space that the FDT2 stand, or FDT standard stepped into, was to find a way to technically address all of these issues and take away all the problems both for the vendors and the end users to seamlessly integrate all the things that we've just been talking about. So why FTT? Not only for this broad integration capability, but also to be able to manage that over the entire life cycle of a facility. So whether you're looking at it from the time of engineering, commissioning, operating, maintenance, even decommissioning, the standard should support you in that activity equally well. So, the, so in the end, who benefits from our FDT standard? Well, clearly, I mean, at one end of the spectrum is all the device manufacturers that make the end devices that would like to have their device work with any system that's out there. It's an obvious goal of these device manufacturers to do that because then you as the end user can say, well, I've chosen this PLC or I've chosen this particular DCS now I want your instruments to work with that. And so that's their goal. So their advantage is with a standard like FDT, they only need to write one driver as it were for their device and it'll work in any system that it appears in. From a host supplier, the DCS guys, the PLC guys, there's companies out there just with asset management applications, calibration applications, those kinds of things. Their advantage is really just on the other side of that issue. Now they don't have to be restricted to just the selection of devices they have or that a few companies have integrated into their system. They can make best-in-class complete automation packages by being able to pick the vendors along with your assistants that integrate the application the best way, knowing it'll all work together. But I think when that all trickles down, the advantage really is for the end user because the end user is the one that gets to say then, now I can pick the absolute best in class opportunities for my environment. I don't have to worry about the particular network. I don't have to worry about the vendor of the devices and I don't have to worry about the higher level systems. In fact, I can even come back on existing systems with the standard and say, I've already got a DCS. Now I wanna add an asset management application. With FDT, you can usually do that on the top of the DCS without interfering with the DCS. And we'll show some of that in Juan will uh, highlight some cases of that for you as well. So our focus from the beginning of the FTT group has always been, you know, let's look at it from the end user's perspective and then make sure it fits to the rest of the model as well. So we think we've really got the standard that gives this best in choice, you know, world-class types device selection for you. We've promised to the industry that we would always protect your investment from a compatibility perspective. Our standard is always moving forward, as you would imagine. New features, new capabilities, new networks to address, so on and so forth. And if every time we up the revision on our standard, if that meant you had to go back and start everything over in your facility, it wouldn't be acceptable in most ap automation applications. So our commitment to the industry from word go was that we'd always be backwards compatible. We just demonstrated that again because we've released an updated version of our standard this past summer. And you can go and pick up an application that is the new updated version and it'll still work with all the devices that were already configured in the factory without having to change anything. So we continue to honor that promise of investment protection. You'll see one of the really neat features of this whole standard is that you've got plant-wide access to the intelligent information in your devices. We can go through any network to get to any device. We can go through any number of networks to get to a single device. And you can be anywhere in your facility on that architecture and talk to that device. So you're able to access all the intelligence that sits out there on these networks. 
that before was very difficult to get at, now the FTT standard does it for you and we'll show you how that works here today. And then finally, we've really engineered the thing to have features over the entire life cycle and I think you'll see that both in the presentations today and as you get to the demonstrations, some really powerful features. So from a vendor requirement, there were a few other slants and that's they really, in the end, the device vendor said, the problem is simple. Let us write one driver for our device and we can make it a fantastic driver that gives you all the bells and whistles of that device but we only want to do it once. We don't want to do this for each system. So the standard allows them to do that. And you'll see that in just a minute. Yet we didn't want to handcuff them so that every vendor looked the same because clearly each vendor has unique capabilities in their devices. And if we wrote a standard that was so rigid and so narrow, they could never take advantage of those features. And then you as the end user would be shopping and never see any difference between like devices. So they've got this very broad creative capability with the standard to really show off the features in their devices. And all of the vendors here in their demo areas are, are ready to show you what some of those advanced features look like. Um, we do support every network that's out there in the industry, but vendors, if they have a legacy network that was maybe something they created years ago and they don't really sell it anymore, but they have the need to support it, they can add that to the standard as well. So it, even though we know nothing about that particular network, the standard allows them to add that to the capabilities. So FTT as an organization is supported by these 90 some companies. It's an always growing thing. You can see it's pretty much the who's who in factory and process automation is represented from around the world, as well as several universities, several large uh, end users that have an absolute commitment to deploying FTT in all of their facilities. Um, and this list continues to grow. This is the only funding, by the way, for the FDT group. All of these companies pay annual membership dues, and that's what funds our activities. We are a true nonprofit, so we're not out there selling products or doing anything else. We're just there to support the standard in any way that we can. Interestingly, most of these companies give up a lot of volunteer time towards the activity of the FDT group as well. So when we're working on a new standard, it's not unusual that one of the end users will say, hey, we've got a real interest in the updated version of the standard. So we'll send one of our technical experts to the technical committees to help make sure our interests are represented. Or it can be marketing or other areas of the organization. So from an FDT perspective, we keep a pretty uh, level-headed set of goals out there. We really are the platform of choice for integration. We're not another network organization. Some people sometimes think, yeah, we're you know, yet another network, another heart, Profibus. That's not true. We don't do anything in the way of network standards other than support everything that's out there in the industry. We work with all the other network foundations to make sure their networks work on our standards. So we kind of sit atop of all those other communication networks. And of course, our, our ultimate measure is, are we improving the efficiency of our customers? Is their automation applications getting better as a result of our standard? So we've been around for a while. Uh, you could trace the beginning of the FTT group back to 1998 when a group of manufacturers got together and said, this is really painful to do any integration in factory automation. And looking at the audience, a few people are old enough to be around during those times and could probably tell a lot of war stories about unique integration issues and so on. So, but if you fast forward to uh, just about three years ago in 2009, is when the FDT standard was taken to the International Standard Organization, IEC, which has worldwide representation. We presented the standard, it went through the voting process, and the FDT standard was accepted as an IEC standard. In fact, we had the unique honor of being one of the few standards to ever get a unanimous vote from all countries. Nobody disagreed with the standard becoming an international standard. So we are now an IEC 62453 is the number of our standard. Um, not everybody has a big interest in it, but I think sometimes, if nothing else, it's comforting to know it's not just a few companies that got together and are trying to maintain some little niche standard. It truly is an internationally uh, recognized standard. And we also have credentials in other countries like China, the US, Canada, and so on that have their own uh, standards organizations. So. Let's kind of get you geared up sir, for some terminology about FDT so that as the other 
people talk a little bit about it or you go around and see the demos, you're kind of comfortable with the terms and how it all fits together. So this will be pretty low level. So if you're looking for any serious network conversations here or something, it won't quite happen at this level. So we can kind of equate our whole issue to what's going on in the uh, smartphone market right now. You know, for a long time, it was Apple was the smartphone. And so it was simple. If you saw an app, it worked on your iPhone, life was good. But now, of course, there's many competitors to the iPhone out there. And it usually boils down to the operating system behind it. So you've got Android out there now, you've got Microsoft out there, uh, you've got BlackBerry with their version. And the unfortunate thing is you see a neat app on one market and it's not necessarily available for your favorite phone. So I just did the conversion from iPhone to Galaxy S3 and all my favorite apps from the iPhone no longer work on the Galaxy S3. So now I shop around, you know, what can I get that's close to what I used to love, those kind of issues. So it's a very similar problem to what the automation industry had on its hands a few years ago. You know, and the question is, how can we take these apps, call them drivers, if you will, and in theory, make them operate on every smartphone? Instead of worrying about what operating system is, it should just work on every smartphone. Life would be wonderful if that could happen. So those apps in the FDT terminology are called DTMs, and I'll, I'll show you what that means here in just a second. We don't call them apps, we call them DTMs, but those are the drivers that all the instrument and device manufacturers make for their devices. So you can think of them much like an app, but we call them a DTM. And our job is to make sure that that app, that DTM, works on any system regardless of whose it is. That's the job of the standard. So, all DTMs, all apps, run on any application. And in the FDT terminology, we call those applications frames. Okay, those are called frames. So, we would call a PLC a frame application. So, if you're in there in the PLC configuration utility writing code, that's a frame. If you're on your DCS system and you're worried about talking to devices, that's a frame. If you're on an asset management application trying to troubleshoot something or looking at what's installed where, that's a frame. And all of those frames use the DTMs to talk to all the devices. Okay, so that's the general concept. So sometimes it helps to think of DTMs like an app and the frames like all the different phones that are on the market. So here is our basic look of a typical FDT application. So this is the DTM, this is the part, the app, the driver that's supplied by the device manufacturer. And this other part that goes around it is called a frame. And in fact, the fact that it goes around it like that is where the term frame came from, because it kind of frames up the DTM. It's the frame, it holds the DTM. So interesting thing about the FDT part of this story is what we really do is define this orange line that you see right here. How should this DTM talk to the frame? And how should the frame be able to talk to the DTM? Because in the end, it's all about this communications between those two general pieces of software. So that's what most of the FDT standard deals with, is how to make those two pieces talk. And obviously, there's a lot that has to go on in there. And we'll show you a few of those things. So here's the frame. So we've taken away the DTM for a minute just so we can focus on the frame. And as I said, the frame could be your PLC system, your DCS system, an asset management system, whatever it is. Sometimes you'll have a frame and you don't even realize it. Uh, a device manufacturer can ship a little FDT application to you to configure their device and it's really their DTM running in a frame and you never even know it. But you'd probably recognize it now after today, you'll say, hey, that looks an awful lot like a frame to me. And you, with a little looking, you'll say, sure enough, it's an FTT application. So this frame here has a project tree that is the architecture of the plant. And Juan's going to go through some detailed examples of that for you so you get a little bit better feel. But here's the complete architecture of the plant, starting anywhere up at the PC that you're working on now, maybe connected to an Ethernet network and so on and so forth, all the devices under there, all the other networks under there. So you basically can click on any device that's in your facility on using this navigation tree, and the DTM that represents that device will pop up over here. Okay, so this is the frame. 
there can be many, many DTMs loaded in a frame. You always see only one at a time, but there can be dozens or thousands of DTMs in a frame so that when you click on a device in this tree, it pops up over here. So the DTM, again, think of it as the app. It's always shipped by the device manufacturer, and that app can be very extensive, as you'll see here today. It's not just a few boxes of configuring, you know, some primary values, some scaling kind of things. It's way beyond that. If it's a simple device, maybe that's all you need, but there's very few simple devices left in this world anymore. So there's usually hundreds of parameters, so these DTMs will have wizards that walk you through, what are you trying to set up? What kind of application is this? And take away the drudgery of having to set most of those values for that device. And this is getting to be pretty significant because very intelligent devices like mass Coriolis flow meters, dr AC drives are starting to show up with thousands of parameters in them. And it's to the point where you can't possibly configure it by hand anymore. You need a wizard to walk you through it. So it not only saves time, it saves errors. So this device driver, this DTM, can be supplied by the device manufacturer with all sorts of wizards and capabilities in it. And we'll take a look at what some of those are. The main thing to always think about, though, is that DTM is the piece of software, the driver, that gives you the access to that remote device somewhere out in your application. That's the job of the DTM. It represents that device sitting out there on the network. And that DTM always comes from the device manufacturer. So as you're looking at the exhibits today and seeing the demos of those things, just remember if Vega, for instance, just as I'm looking at them in the back of the room, or Krona here, shows you a DTM, that's their DTM for their device. They're always paired together. So some common things on a DTM, and, and Juan is going to walk through a little bit more detail on this, but just to kind of warm me up to this is, First of all, interestingly, the DTM is protocol independent. So you probably have seen this where many people will offer the same device on different networks just because of markets, customer needs, and so on. It's the same device. It just it happens to be on different networks. They can write one DTM, and they don't care about what network it's on. And the reason is is because we handle the network with another DTM, a communications DTM. So this will play out here in just a few minutes that you'll see that. So they're protocol independent. Doesn't matter what network it's actually operating on. They have this large graphical area that they can completely tailor for their device and their application. There's no restriction put on there by the standard as to what they can do in that center part. Every possible thing you can imagine from a computer perspective is available to them. Whether it's extensive graphs, 3D models, moving, rotating, anything they need to do to help you with that device, they can put into that area of the DTM. What we do is we do specify a few standard things. Like we say, look, the menu for this DTM always has to be up here. And the reason is we're thinking of you as the end user. Because if every DTM supplier could put their menu wherever they wanted, you'd go nuts after opening up a dozen DTMs, trying to remember where's the menu on this one and how come I have to go over here and now I gotta go under there. So we do specify a few things just to help you with consistent navigation in the DTM. But outside of that, there's a lot of freedom for these manufacturers to do what they wanna do. Juan will show you how that actually works in his presentation. So let's just look at a few screenshots of DTMs to give you a sense of what these things can all do. And of course, the best thing is later today when you see the live ones and see what they're actually doing because they've got some great demos for you of this stuff. So here's a typical advanced configuration, maybe a, a radar uh, tank level gauge kind of application where they're walking you through here with the wizard where you actually have pre-configured what's the shape of the tank, what kind of tank, what's its shape, and so on and so forth. So it will then handle most of the configuration of that gauge for you. Okay, but you see they have this complete freedom here to do whatever they want. You notice there's a walkthrough setup here that they're going through. They're already on the second step of the setup for that particular device. And then there's other things here that they can add as well, like diagnostics, you know, advanced settings or additional things you normally don't have to mess around with, information type things. They can put online manuals in there, just about anything you can imagine. They control with this navigation menu that you see here. Here's another type of uh, view of a DTM where they're helping you with alarm management. So looking at the state of the device and saying, do we have an alarm condition here? 
and you see that represented in various graphical forms. So color coding to indicate alarm conditions and then help to sh let you diagnose why does that alarm condition exist. One of the more popular topics these days is all the diagnostic capabilities that people are putting into their DTM. So not only is it easy to configure these devices through a DTM, now it's super easy to monitor the health of the devices and leverage that intelligence in those devices to your advantage. So what you've got here, and you'll actually see this across the aisle here today, this particular DTM, this is showing the health of the network. So in the past, we always worried just about the health of the devices. Now you can an monitor the health of the network itself, which often is a cause of the issues. You've probably had the experience where a terminating resistor has gone missing. You know, maybe somebody opened up a cabinet and just bumped it and it came out, or somebody hits a network cable with a forklift tine, you know, or all those things that interrupt the network that look really bizarre from a control system perspective as to what's happening. Here with this kind of DTM, you can actually dive in and say, okay, let's look at the network and see what's going on here. And it'll tell you, oh, you lost a terminating resistor, or gee, there's a lot of noise on this network. Or if you're operating a network that has redundant power supplies, it'll let you know, hey, your primary supply just failed and we're on your backup supply. All the things that in the past, you would just wait till it was a major crash in the facility before you'd get after it. Now the DTMs actually walk you through those issues. Here it's showing you particular warnings and segments where it's saying, okay, some of these segments are just fine, some need some attention, and some are outright critical. You've got to get out there and do something now. And watch for this when you're looking at the uh, demos today. One of the more complicated things in a typical process automation to do are things like partial stroke tests. It takes a lot of intelligence in the driver for that valve and controller to actually operate that test properly. You need a certain amount of historical data. You got to carefully analyze trend information and so on to make it effective. So what you saw in the past was people that were really on the better end of these valve packages would write standalone applications to do PSTs as an example. So today now that PST thing is built right into the DTM. So not only have you done all the configuration of the valve and the controller in the DTM, now you can monitor the performance over its life cycle and know when it's time to get out there and do some maintenance. And that's what you're seeing here is the trends of a PST application being run through the DTM. So that gives you a glimpse of standard device DTMs, and you'll see a lot more here from Juan and from the live demos. Let me transition a little bit to communications as to how that works in our architecture. Well, first be aware we support all networks that are out there in the industry. If it's process or factory automation, it's already supported. There's a few new networks that have come along that we're working with those network organizations to get them supported as well. So if there's something on our list that you don't see, make sure you raise the awareness to these guys today that, hey, you'd really like to see this network added, and we'll get after that. Because most network groups love to be on the FDT standard because obviously it helps them with their issues as well. The nice thing about our standard, the guys who originally conceived the technology behind it said, you know, this network thing is always going to be a problem. There's always going to be new networks coming out. There's always going to be these weird proprietary networks. Let's not have to re-release the entire standard every time another network has to be dealt with. So they created a simple technique that allows us to release what's called an annex without touching the standard and without touching anything in the installed base. And when we release that annex, that new network suddenly works on the installed base of equipment. And that works because all the communications vendors, all the gateways and things, write DTMs that comply with that new annex and it just snaps on to all the existing frames. It's a very neat technology and we've been able to knock off a couple of networks a year that way, adding them to the standard just through releases of annexes. So how does this work? Well, you can do the typical, I gotta get a notebook out to a device and just check it by plugging into the device or maybe it's a workbench application where something came back and now you want your check tech to give it a thorough checkout to make sure it's right before you put it back on the shelf, um, whatever the case may be, you can do this talk directly to the device thing through the notebook computer. So here you've got an FDT application running. It's just showing one of the popular ones called Pactware. Um, 
You've got a little protocol converter here to go from your USB to whatever that device is, and it can talk directly to that device with the DTM for that device. Very straightforward, simple application. Where I think it's got a little bit more value is in the network side of things. Uh, you can do this same thing where you've got that same Pactware application sitting up here, and maybe this is an Ethernet layer going down through a protocol converter, and now maybe you're on a Profibus layer, and now you go through some scanner, and maybe now you're on a heart layer. Whatever it is, you can pick whatever networks work for you in that architecture. And this workstation can automatically go through all these networks and talk to that device. The really neat thing about the standard is you don't have to worry about how it does it. Once you say these are the links of these networks, it just goes and talks to the device. We don't affect these other networks in the process other than putting a little traffic on them. They're not even aware that we're talking to a heart device down here in this example, up here at the Profibus level, for example. They don't even know it. It's just a packet that goes through the network and we handle all that for them. So they don't have to modify their standards. It just works because of the FDT standard. So you could take this and you can move this notebook computer around in this architecture too. It might be that the instrument techs are normally down here at this level, that they're not up at the ethernet level. So you can have them plug in here and get the same access to those devices. So availability of DTMs and frames. Obviously this whole thing hinges on, yeah, but are my devices available and can I add this kind of application in my overall control package? Um, they're available from many different suppliers. You do not have to be a member of FDT to make DTMs. And there are many, many suppliers that do that. It's an open standard. We don't require membership to do those kind of things. So they pick up the standard and they create DTMs. Today there's DTMs available for more than 4,000 devices. And in fact, I think this year now we're over 5,000 devices supported. So it continues to grow. Um, and they come from these device manufacturers. And, and Juan will give you a little bit more look at that. Similarly, the frames. There's dozens of frames applications available. As I mentioned, some people will use it as their own little configuration tool. Other times it is your DCS is the frame application. Just depends. Now, if you're looking for certified DTMs and frames, one of the services we do to the industry, and this was driven by some of the big users of the FDT standard, is they said, look, this is all great, but we want to know that the DTM we're putting in our system really does comply with the standard. We don't want to be the ones debugging that DTM in our application. So we run a certification process. We contract with individual labs. We audit the labs for their ability to run through a series of tests to say, yeah, this DTM really does meet the FDT standard. Once they tell it it does, we give them a certificate and we put them on our website. So Juan will show you a glimpse of that website when you're uh, watching his presentation today. One other thing to be aware of about the FDT standards is it does fit both brownfield and greenfield type applications. Brownfield could be as simple as you don't have an asset management application today and you'd love to add that to the top of your overall control system. That's a very realistic thing to do with FDT to go get an asset management tool, load it up with DTMs, and now you can talk to all your devices without disturbing your DCS. Greenfield facilities obviously work equally well. Uh, many of our large customers that you see as members, that's their specification. It has to be FDT based, and it's gotta use all certified DTMs. It will be a typical specification from the really big users because they've seen the value of it and they wanna propagate it throughout all of their facilities. So just a little conclusion before I, we turn it over to the next presenter is um, for, we think we've really met these user requirements. We've done a good job, but in the end, you guys as end users are the judge. So if you see something as you're looking at the standard that you think we didn't meet the objective or you think we missed an objective, don't hesitate to get a hold of us and let us know. Most of our work is based on what the end users want and need. And then we drive that backwards through how does that impact the vendors? Okay, so don't ever hesitate, even though you're not a member of the FDT group, just to send me an email and say, hey, you know, we're looking at this and we think you missed something here or you didn't think about this. We'd love to hear from you. I mentioned we just released a new version of the standard. We incorporated more than 45, I think it was, some requested features in that version of the standard, and we only left three behind. And the three behind will be in the next version. We just ran out of time. 
So we're very responsive to what people say they need in the standard. Um, so we think we've done a good job here, but you guys be the judge as you take a little closer look at it.